so thankful for when the songs just so appropriately set us up for how we're going to open the word of God. Also makes it harder for me because I'm singing knowing what I'm about to say. So um, it's so nice to see that context being set. Speaking of context, I want to set the context for this morning's message by asking you a question, a very simple question. Who do you love? Think about it for a moment. Who do you love? Now, as I said, that's a very simple question, and it should be rather easy to answer. However, I wonder if you answered it correctly. Now, I have no doubt that individuals you think you love came to mind when I asked that question. But what I'm curious about is whether or not you actually love them. For clarification, I'm not talking about sincerity, measure, or manner. I'm not asking if you love them as much as you should or in the way that you should. What I'm asking is, do you actually love them at all? Is what you're thinking of is love actually love? Think about that. Where did you get your definition for that term? Do you remember? Did you derive your understanding of what love is from God's revealed word? Or did you pick it up along the way while living in this rebellious fallen world? I think all of us know that the first method is the correct way to define the term. But if we're honest with ourselves we'll probably need to admit that we are still either recovering from or still using the second method to define love, the one we picked up from the world. After all, which one did you just use when I asked you that question? It's not intended to be some kind of gotcha moment. I don't get into that kind of nonsense. But because I do love you, because I have great interest in making sure that you, I have great interest in making sure you leave here today knowing how to answer that question. Because I love you, I want to make sure you know what love actually is so that you will always be able to answer the question, who do you love, correctly. In order to do so, we have to start by getting the right definition of the word. What? is love. Go ahead, if you would, and churn or move in your device to 1 John chapter 4. I'm going to start here in verse 7. I'll begin reading as you're looking for it. You can join in when you get there. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. 
Brothers and sisters, what is love? John says it here, right? Twice, he says it clear as day. God is love. Not simply God is lovely, not simply God loves or God does loving things. No, God is love. Love is who he is. Mind you, the word order is very important here. John is not saying what we think of as love defines who God is. No, no, no. That is clearly not the way the, word, the phrasing is in the Greek, and it would make absolutely no sense with the context of what we just read. John is being very precise and very descriptive here to make sure that his readers understand that who God is is what defines love. His essence, his nature, his very being defines the concept of love. That is very peculiar. That's very strange. That's not how we think about love at all, is it? We think of love as something we do, something we feel, something we experience. And John does speak about it that way in these verses, but he does so as a manner of elaborating on and explaining his primary and foundational point that God is love. Throughout these verses, and in fact, throughout this entire letter, John is confirming that yes, love indeed is something that is done. It is something that is felt. It is something that is experienced, received, and given. But all of these manifestations, all of these acts, all of these emotions that are rightly called love are born from one and one place only. The very nature of God. True love, proper love, Genuine love comes from who God is. Therefore, in order to properly understand and define love, we must know who God is. Right? John made that clear in verses 7 and 8. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In order to understand and do love, you must know God. And the only way you can know God is if you are born of God. If a person is not born of God, he or she does not know God and consequently cannot know what love is. It is a prerequisite to understanding the term. That's what's so beautiful about verse 9. We know what love is because God has made himself known to us by making us alive through his son. Verse nine, in this, the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. When we are reborn through the redeeming work of Jesus Christ, the new life we receive is given to us so that we may know God. John three sixteen. For God loved the world in this way. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. Later on in John 17, 3, when Jesus is praying to the father, he says, and this is eternal life. He defines eternal life. He says that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Eternal life is knowing God. We have been made, rescued, redeemed, and restored to know who God is. And if you know who God is, you know what love is. Because God is love. So that brings up an important question. Who is God? Well, it's kind of a big question, no? We're going to spend all summer talking about it, and we aren't even going to begin to touch the tiniest little drop of the tip of the iceberg of who he is. There's a lot to know about our infinite God. We will actually spend all of eternity, eternity endlessly learning more and more of who he is, never completely getting it all. For all time, we will be learning who God is. 
So where does that leave us for knowing him and consequently knowing what love is now? It's knowing God determines what we're going to know of love and we can't comprehend all of them. How are we going to get our head around all that? Well, thankfully, though we cannot fully comprehend the totality of who God is in our little finite minds, he has graciously graciously revealed himself in such a way that we can see a functional and fulfilling summary of who he is and what he is about. Though he is beyond comprehension, he has condescended in a generous, gracious, beautiful way that allows those of us who have been redeemed and restored by Jesus Christ to clearly and truly know the very core of his being. Now, you you may think to yourself, how can that be true? How can a God that is beyond comprehension, that is so vast, so magnificent, so transcendent, that he will never be fully understood, how could he give a summary of himself that would let us truly understand who he is and what he is about in a complete way? Again, that's also a very good question. I'm assuming you're thinking all these good questions. While that's a good question, I think you'll see that it is easily possible to discover such a summary by simply applying some plain and obvious logic. I'm going to do a little bit of a seminary theology class here for a few minutes, but I think we'll be able to follow. If God has a primary motive, a core reason for which he does all things, an ultimate and chief end for everything he does, one primary purpose, then it is fair and right to conclude that that one chief purpose for which he does every single thing should be reflective of everything that can be known about him. Think about that. If everything he does has one ultimate purpose, then everything he is at least every aspect of his nature that can be known, must be used in carrying out that one purpose. If it wasn't, then part of who God is would never be used and consequently could not be known, right? If he does everything for the one purpose, everything he's going to reveal about himself must be done to serve that purpose. Otherwise, it can't be known. If you only have one purpose behind everything you do, one reason for all actions and part of who you are isn't used in accomplishing that, that it can't actually be known as part of who you are because it will never have opportunity to be used and therefore displayed. Example here. I think this is easy to follow. If you say someone is good, all right, imagine somebody, you say someone is good, but he never does good. Can you say that person is actually good? No, you can't say he's good because there's no way to know if he is good. He may very well have the capacity to do good, but if he doesn't do good, we cannot rightly ascribe him the attribute because we've not seen it displayed. We would be ignorant of it. So it is with God. If he has one chief end, one ultimate purpose for which he does everything he does, then we must logically conclude that every aspect of his being that can be known is used and expressed in carrying out that one purpose. Otherwise, it is not used and cannot rightly be known to be part of who God is. Now, this could be a waste of time. If he doesn't have one chief end, If he doesn't have one ultimate and primary reason for which he does everything, this logic just goes right out the window, right? It doesn't matter anymore. If that is the case, then we're never going to be able to fully define what love is because we are never going to be able to fully understand who God is. He's just too big. If who God is defines love, then our understanding of love is necessarily limited to what we can know of who God is. Therefore, if he doesn't have one chief purpose, we are going to be left with a limited understanding of what love is. And it doesn't seem like that's how the biblical authors work with that word. However, 
If he does have one ultimate purpose, then knowing that one purpose will help us understand who he is and what he is about. And once we have an understanding of who God is and what he is about, then we can define love because God is love. Congratulations, you all get three-hour credits for that right now. Brothers and sisters, I have good news for you this morning. I have something I want to show you. I want you to listen and tell me if you hear a theme. Leviticus 10, 3. The Lord says, Before all the people, I will be glorified. Isaiah 43, six through seven. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the end of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory. Isaiah 48, nine through 11. For my name's sake, I defer my anger. For the sake of my praise, I restrain it for you that I might not cut you off. Behold, I have refined you, but not as silver. I have tried you in the furnace of affliction for my own sake. For my own sake, I do it. For how should my name be profaned? My glory, I will not give to another. Jeremiah 13, 11. I made the whole house of Israel and the whole house of Judah cling to me, declares the Lord, that they might be for me a people, a name, a praise, and a glory. Matthew 5, 16, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your father who is in heaven. John 12, 27 and 28, Jesus says, for this purpose, I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. Romans eleven thirty six. 36, from him and through him and to him are all things to him be glory forever. Ephesians 1, 5 and 6, in love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will to the praise of his glorious grace. Philippians 2, 9 through 11. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Do you have any idea how many verses I just had to leave out? Page after page after page, paragraph after paragraph after paragraph, seemingly line by line, scripture is blowing up. God has one purpose and one purpose only, and it is to display his glory. It is his glory. I was going to say all consuming, but God can't be consumed. It is his chief end. It is the reason for everything. He does indeed have one purpose to display his glory, to show who he is. If you find anything in scripture that seems to be to the contrary, friends, let me tell you, just keep reading or pay attention better. And you will find, oh, that totally is displaying who he is. It's what he's all about. It's why he does everything. So who is God? He is the one doing all things to make himself known through the display of all his incomprehensible glory. Though we will never be able to fully understand him, we do know what he is all about And we have the privilege of not only being able to enjoy the unsurpassed pleasure of experiencing his display of his immeasurable greatness, but we also have the inconceivable privilege of being called to participate in displaying his immeasurable greatness. Us. Do you know you? 
I know me. That's crazy. God has called us to display his greatness. Remember the text? 1 John 4, 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. <coughs> Beloved, let us love one another. What is love? God is love. And if God is all about displaying the glory of who he is, then love must be all about displaying the glory of who he is. Therefore, love is the display of God. That is the definition of the concept. Love is the display of God's glory. Look at this. Listen to verse 7 when I do this, when I use this concept, this definition of love. I, I know I'm doing a rewrite. Somebody please don't take a clip of this and say Zach's manipulating scripture. I'm using the definition. I'm going to plug it in. I want you to see verse 7 here. I'm going to read it. Look how well it works. Beloved, let us display God's glory to one another. For the display of God's glory is from God. And whoever displays God's glory has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not display God's glory does not know God because God is all about displaying his glory. Apart from being redundant, do you see how that works? This is what love is, verse 9. And this the love of God was made manifest among us. God's purpose of displaying his greatness was shown to us, was made manifest to us. How? That God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. Brothers and sisters, what is the son? Colossians 1.15. He is the image of the invisible God. Hebrews 1.3. He is the radiance of the glory of God in the exact imprint of his nature. God manifested his love to us by sending the perfect display of who he is in the Son so that we might live through him. What is the life we get through the Son? We already talked about this. It's eternal life, which is what? Knowing the Father and Jesus Christ, whom he sent. Seeing who God is. John says God is love, and then he says the manifestation of God's love, the revealing of it, is God sending the perfect display of his glory, his son, into the world so that we may be given new life through him in order to know God, which results in us seeing and displaying the glory of God. What? How great a salvation you have received! Once you see this, you can go back through this entire passage. In fact, you can go back through the entire letter and see that this is clearly what John has in mind. Love is the display of God. To be loving is to do something for the purpose of displaying who God is. To love God is to know who he is and then respond by reflecting who he is back to himself. You cannot separate love true love, real love from the display of God's glory because that is the very essence of what love is. So I ask you again, who do you love? The people you thought about when I first asked that question, your spouse, your children, your parents, your friends? Do you show them who God is? Are you concerned, committed, and in conversation with them to make God better known in their life? Are you trying to live your life in front of them in such a way that reflects God's glory? Would they say, the chief end of your relationship, the primary aim is to display the immeasurable greatness of who God is. See, brothers and sisters, we have a problem when we think about love. We live amongst a people that almost, almost understand it correctly. 
In fact, they are so close to properly understanding love that if we don't pay attention, we can end up thinking of it the exact same way they do. They rightly understand that to love is to make much of something. The problem is they don't make much of the right thing. Love is not making much of yourself. Love is not making much of some item or object. Love is not making much of another person in and of themselves, whether it be friend, family, even child or spouse. Love is making much of God because that is what God does. And God is love. I think we also have another problem when we think about love. I think we may be under the impression that it is somehow optional. That we can choose who we do and do not love. We have a Bible problem with that. Because verse 20 says, If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. Do you find that part about not seeing God peculiar? Does it kind of seem almost out of place? He referenced it in verse 12 too, if you'll remember. He says, no one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. No one has ever seen God. Doesn't make sense when you use the world's definition of love doesn't work. But when you realize love is actually about displaying God's glory, it makes perfect sense. No one has ever seen God. No one has ever seen God. If we display who God is to one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. Seeing God, displaying God. This verse, for he who does not display God's glory to his brother whom he has seen cannot reflect God's glory back to God whom he has not seen. I think having the wrong definition of love has had a lot to do with why we treat this command like it's optional. In all likelihood, you probably pick and choose who you love and when you will and will not love them based on thinking love has something to do with making much of them or making much of yourself. But I hope you now understand that's not the case. The command to love one another, which John is repeating from Jesus, by the way, is absolutely not a command to make much of you or any other person in and of themselves. No. The command to love one another is a command to interact with one another in such a way that fulfills God's purpose of making himself known. You love one another by displaying God's glory to one another. You tell people of God's mercy and you display mercy to them. You tell people of God's grace and you display God's grace to them. You tell people of God's sovereignty and you display it by being fearlessly confident in the way you live under it. Right? There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. There is no fear in seeing the good and merciful God who sovereignly rules over all things, but fully seeing this glorious God cast out fear. If you live to display God's glory to everyone, you live a life of love. You live a life of fulfillment. After all, what were you made to do? You were made to bear God's image, to display his glory. If you properly love everyone, that's exactly what you're going to do. You end up living a life that looks a lot like the one who was the perfect display of God, Jesus. And that makes perfect sense because Jesus was God and God is love. 
Look to Christ. See how he lived in this world. What did he value? How did he act? How did he treat people? What did he say? What did he do? Because all of it was love. In John 5, he said, whatever the father does, that the son does likewise. And as we have seen, the father is always displaying his glory, making himself known. That means displaying God is what Jesus's entire life was about. So if we look to him and follow him and live the way he lived, observing everything he commanded and modeled, we will love everyone because we will be living to make God known to everyone. Do you want to do that? Pause. I'm not asking if you're good at it. Do you want to do that? I need you to answer this question. Now, in your heart, do you want to display God? Do you want to make him known? This is very important according to the text. John wrote, whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God. He also wrote, if anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. If you go down further into chapter five, verse three, he also writes, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. All of his commandments are about displaying who he is. Jesus sums that up by saying, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Because that's what they were all about. Friends, if you have no desire to know and display God, You need to understand that you have no God to display. I say that because I do love you. And I want to make him known to you so that we can all love him together. Come talk to me or go talk to someone that you see living and displaying God's glory. We would love to show you this amazing God so that you can spend and enjoy the rest of your life doing what you were made to do. Display who he is. Grace Fellowship. We exist to spread God's fame by making disciples of Jesus Christ. I hope you now see that means we exist to love. In order to do so, you need to know Christ. You need to know God. You need to search for and expand your understanding of this incomprehensible God and the word he has given you. The word of God. Don't simply read it. Do read it. Don't simply read it. Learn. Search. There's treasure in them, their pages. Go find it. Get rid of every weight that hinders you. Everything that is distracting you from knowing God. Equip yourself with support for the pursuit. Spend time with brothers and sisters for the purpose of getting to know what they know about the Lord and his word. Realign your schedule and that of your family so that discovering and displaying God's glory is overtly the driving purpose of your time. Think about ways you can set up regular opportunities to make God known to others. Engage in your community in such a way that you are an exemplary citizen for the purpose of displaying God's glory. And remain mindful that if you say you love God, but you aren't making him known to those around you as you engage, 
You're being a liar. Be intentional to make sure he is your first and only priority in everything you do. Guys, I know that's hard. I just said, be mindful to make sure he is the first and only priority in everything you do. I get it. This world is against us in this endeavor. And until Jesus returns, guess what? Your flesh ain't doing you no favors either. But as John actually wrote right before the passage we looked at this morning, he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. You know what that means? That means if you've been born of God by the redeeming work of Jesus Christ, Almighty God is in you. God is in you. The God who created all things and does all things for the chief and primary purpose of displaying who he is, his very spirit abides in you, which means you can and will display his glory. That is why you were called beloved, because God has made himself known to you. And if God has made himself known to you, it is so you can display him to others, because that is the chief and ultimate reason for which he does everything. Which means you can love others correctly, because the God who is all about displaying his glory in everything is in you which means love is in you because God is love. As the band's coming back up, I want to take a moment to address something that may seem to be a bit of an elephant in the room for some of you. If God is love and God is all about displaying his greatness, which means that is what love is, does that mean love is void of emotion? Does that mean love is void of care, value, esteem, affection, pleasure? Are those things unnecessary in love? Should we leave them out of love? Can love exist without them? No, love cannot exist without them. Not because they define love, but because they are the inevitable consequences of love. What do you value most? that which appears to have the most worth. What do you take the most pleasure in? That which most stirs your affections. What do you care for most? That which appears to be most valuable. And what is it that stirs your affections the most? That for which you have the greatest esteem. All of what we think of as the emotional aspects of love are born from what we value and are moved by the most. And logically, we should all value and most be moved by what is best, right? That's hard to think of in our subjective world. But we know there is a best. The first part of Psalm 40, verse 5 says, You have multiplied, O Lord my God, your wondrous deeds and your thoughts towards us. None can compare with you. Not only is there nothing better than God, there isn't even anything worth comparing to him. He is the most valuable and moving thing in all of existence because he is better than anything else. There is nothing better than God. And he is doing everything he does to display the best thing we can possibly experience. When you recognize, receive, and know the best thing that can possibly be experienced, you will be moved. You will value it supremely. You will desire it above all things. You will cherish it with a stirring of the affections beyond comprehension. And you will enjoy a pleasure that the apostle Peter described as inexpressible and filled with glory. Which is another word for displaying who God is. That is why David writes what he does in the second half of Psalm 40, verse 5. You have multiplied, O Lord my God, your wondrous deeds and your thoughts towards us. None can compare with you. I will proclaim and tell of them, yet they are more than can be told. 
know God and display who he is, the more you do, the more you will enjoy love because that is what God has made you to do as part of his design in making all things to fulfill his ultimate and chief purpose of displaying who he is. Know God and you will enjoy him. Make him known to others and you will bring them true joy. Because joy is the inevitable fruit of love. And God is love. Pray with me for a moment. Father God, you have shown your love to us in a myriad of ways. But predominantly, Lord, when we look through the New Testament, we see it through the giving of your Son, the perfect display of your image. Lord, you have made us as a people for the purpose of displaying who you are, but each one of us has rebelled. Each one has gone astray and looked to our own ways. Though we were not in the garden, we still fully participate in the rebellion. But Lord, in your kindness, apart from any work of our own, you sent your image bearer, your son, Jesus, that we may be restored and redeemed into right relationship with you so that we can display who you are. No greater love have a man than he give his life for his friends. Life is what displays you. Lord, would we not be liars? Would we be a people full of love, not the love the world defines, not the foolishness that approves of making much of what someone wants to do in their rebellion? And we have your love, the kind of love that rescues people from bondage, the kind of love that always speaks truth, the kind of love that stands even though it may cost their life, the kind of love that will risk relationship for the sake of eternity, the kind of love that sues over the greatest of pains, the kind of love that tends to loss that is unimaginable, reminding us that we have received more than we could ever comprehend. May we search your word that we would know who you are, that we may truly be a people of love. May we know you in the power of your resurrection that we may love and display you. We pray these things in the precious name of our wonderful Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen.